Good morning, Charles. How are you? Oh, good morning, Dan. I'm well. How are you? I'm great. Excellent. Um, I am excited to talk about uh, this. We're going to start getting into some of the shorter chapters of this book where we kind of go from point to point to point and uh, not so much of the laying the groundwork of, hey, here's what this book's about. Here's what we're coming from. Here's where we're coming from. Yada, yada. But uh, I mean, I like that part. But I also I like how short the chapters in uh, Atomic Attraction are and how we can kind of jump from thing to thing. And so uh, I'm looking forward to that. But before we get into that, um, what's been uh, what's been going well for you? So this week I made some good progress with my uh, my habit coaching programs. I um I was able to kind of um, th- going through and talking through to some people about what what I've been doing or my my thoughts here. I've mm-hmm. been able to kind of make some some adjustments and um and and spin up a couple of different ideas um, so that um, because not everybody is going to want to learn the entire tiny habits methods and and philosophy. So um, I've, I've come up with a couple of other additional ideas for, for some programs such as a habit troubleshooting uh, program, where basically we kind of go through the ability chain. If you remember that uh, habit. So this is really going to be kind of like a a one-off session for people when they've got, uh, when they've got a habit they're trying to establish and it's just not working for them. And so basically, you know, I, in a pretty quick manner, we can kind of go through some of those things in the ability chain and really help diagnose why it might not be working for them. And I kind of quickly get them back on track uh, if, if um, you know, if they're having some problems. So um, I was pretty excited about that as well as uh, some of the, you know, the, the, uh, the focus mapping exercises for the brainstorming sessions. Some of that could be applied to some, some business concepts too. So I was talking to somebody who is looking to really kind of kick their, their business off the ground and, and wasn't sure where to start. And they have a lot of moving pieces here. So with the fo- focus mapping uh, exercise, I feel like I could really help them isolate what they need to work on first and then what was going to serve them the best to actually get those, those things done. So um, nice. those, those are things that I, I came up with this week. I'm pretty, pretty excited about that as you know to be able to offer that out to people so um yeah nice i um yeah i'm looking forward to seeing uh some of the artifacts that uh you produce um and and you know offering any assistance or guinea pigging that i can along the way as well um, yeah that'd be great appreciate it. i that. have had a pretty good week um there's been some uh, i've taken some opportunities for some sort of complicated uh support issues that have happened with my, with my clients, um, to really take some deliberate steps to, um, not just get in my car and drive to my clients to fix a problem where Mm -hmm. instead I've, I've been focusing on doing whatever I can do to, uh, fix it remotely. Um, including, you know, leaning on some of the onsite personnel to do things for me when they can, as far as, you know, just powering something, off and back on or something like that. So I don't, um, so my, my number one go-to is not just get in my car and drive across the state to go fix a problem. Uh, because you know, I, I'd like to build my business in a way that, uh, I've got a little bit more flexibility about where I'm working from and, and things like that. So it's a matter of, you know, both increasing my remote support tools and, uh, the things I can do not physically at somebody's computer, um, as well as, you know, just kind of setting proper expectations for, you know, okay, I realize you can't do this thing that you would like to do right now. And, you know, that I appreciate that that's difficult. Um, but I won't be able to do anything about it until my next scheduled day on site. And, uh, you know, shockingly, they're always okay with that, even though I, I can tend to, um, uh, catastrophize things like that. Like, Oh no, this, you know, they can't print to their favorite printer. They have to print to their second favorite printer. That's a huge emergency. And I have to get in my car right now. I was like, no, it, it actually isn't. And, uh, <laughs> they're always happy to, to work with me on stuff like that, even though I feel like, Oh no, I have to, yeah, I have to satisfy this need immediately or else. Yeah. Well, uh, that might be a little nice guy tendency coming in there, right? Yeah, no, I'm sure that it is. That's, that's definitely, and you know, there's, there's no easy way to train yourself out of that other than to just train yourself out of it. Right. And, so. and, and feel uncomfortable doing it. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. But that's, that's part of the process. hundred percent. So, okay, cool. Um, let's see. Uh, we are, uh, still in the, uh, fairly close to the beginning of atomic attraction and, uh, 
Let's uh, talk a little bit about where we were last week, um, or last episode. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time on the first case study, which uh, is a is a good one. Um, is very uh, interesting as far as um, talking about what many people do wrong, many guys do wrong versus what they do right. And uh, the big thing is when you see a pretty girl, uh, don't stare at her for a few weeks before <laughs> you decide to say hello. Um, because you know that, that actually is the takeaway yes that's fine. yeah as the prettier they are the more they're used to guys staring at them and the bigger bummer they probably feel like it is you know yeah yeah um so don't do that if uh it, let me just say i i am not a cold approach guy i i have never uh just seen a a girl that i decided okay i have to go say hello to her right now and see if i can you know get her number or get her to agree to a date or anything like just just seeing someone and feeling that level of attraction that it promotes action on my part. That's just not how I'm wired. And I mean, that could be because I don't like the idea of just walking up to someone and introducing myself and asking them out or asking them for their number. Um, it's also just, I've never been so blown away just by someone's, you know, surface level characteristics of how pretty they are that I felt like I had to do that. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't know whether that's a good thing, a bad thing, or just the way that I'm wired. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of, of just seeing someone and thinking, wow, they're so pretty. I have to go. I have to act on that right now. Um, and, and, you know, neither, neither do I see someone and think, wow, they're so pretty. I have to change my daily schedule so that I'm here at this coffee shop the same same day at the same time every day for a couple of weeks so that I could just get a get a good look at them and maybe you know, figure out a way that I could approach them. I mean, yep. both of those things, both what Peter does and what Paul does in that scenario, I'm, I'm not wired to do either of those things. And so I, I'm more comfortable meeting people in, in different ways than they do. Um, so, you know, I, I would say Paul definitely has a preferable approach where, you know, he's, he sees Jane in the scenario and he just says, Hey, um, come here often. I'm Paul. What's your name? Um, that's preferable to you know what Peter does, which is just you know stare at her for a couple of weeks while he builds up the courage to say hello. But uh, I don't resonate with either of these guys too much in this scenario. Uh, what, what's your what was your takeaway? Yeah, so I resonate with both um, because I, when I was <laughs> yeah. younger, when I, when I was younger, I absolutely did you know do that. I remember in college, there was a girl uh, who worked at the the food court, and um, I mean she was just she was really beautiful and uh she would work at the pizza place and i mean i would you know go in there for even though if i wasn't ordering food i would i would go in there regularly you know just just to stare at her and and hopefully somehow you know come be put into a situation magically that i would be able to have a conversation with her you know and and um you know, eventually I started to like order food from her and then <laughs> I think one day I don't know some something you know, took over and I asked her out and she, she actually gave me her number. And, um, you know, I, we, we tried, you know, calling, you know, I, I tried calling her a few times with no response. She didn't, you know, she never called me. And then every time I'd go in there, mm. it's like, Oh, I lost your number. Mm. And, um, and, and that happened for a while, but eventually actually she ended up calling, uh, calling me back and we ended up going out on a couple of dates and, and, you know, we, we hung out a little bit, but, um, I, she was just, you know, I, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, she was out of my sure. league by far in terms of maturity anyway. Um, you know, uh, looks wise, you know, she's absolutely beautiful, but in terms of just being more comfortable being herself. And I was just, I was in my own head the way Peter was in this scenario, you know, I I was just yeah. making these these ideas and these fantasies up of what it would be like to be have this like long term relationship with her and stuff. So, um, you know, I definitely was not, you know, uh, a confident person going into that. And, you know, I'm kind of surprised that she actually ever looking back at it. I'm like, why would you go out with me? You know, um, so maybe she's just really desperate at the time. Who knows? Anyway, we could have been wanting to make some some other guy jealous. I could have been that. I don't know. She 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 was uh she apparently had dated uh, quite a few quite a few guys anyway um but yeah i i absolutely see from both perspectives um uh and uh you know i have gone you know from from one end to the other with with a number of different people um you know not not in recent years but when i was younger absolutely i i, I can yeah. identify on both sides all right i'm glad we've had such 
different experiences that we can come at this uh, a little bit differently from each other. Um, mm. Okay, so let's talk about um, you know masculinity and how men feel about being men and uh, what is kind of you know stacking the deck against us in some ways. Um, so this this book does delve a little bit into the sim- some of the same stuff that um, No More Mister Nice Guy and Robert Glover's material, which you know this. I don't know. It seems to sell books to say, man, it's a it's a tough time to be a man right now. It's like, you know, it, it really isn't. It's it's still a great time to be a man. Um, what's what's not great if you're really bad at being a man and, you know, that reputation kind of catches on about you, then it's going to follow you and people are going to not be cool with it. But this idea that masculinity is the problem. I mean, look, I. I have dated almost exclusively women that would self-identify socially and politically as feminists. Mm -hmm. And I can also say that when I was at my best and most attractive to them was when I was at my most masculine, when I was at my strongest and my most confident, that is when they found me attractive the most. So this idea that, you know, the deck is stacked against us men because of feminism or because of society or whatever. No women of all types are, are looking very hard to find strong, confident, masculine men uh, that they can date and be involved in relationships with the, the deck is stacked against us because we're doing a very poor job of teaching boys what it means to be masculine, strong, confident men and so they come out of puberty with the body of a man and the hormones of a man and the emotional intelligence of a little boy. And so when when they try to act like men, and that's what they're doing, you know, that's what all of us are doing a lot of the time is we're trying to act like men. And so our masculinity is performative instead of authentic. That's when things go off the rails and we end up behaving in ways that people are like, eh, I'm not on board with that. You need to get your crap together because this the version of masculinity that you think you need to be putting out there is not what any of us is looking for. So I'm reminded of a scene from um, The Great Batman Begins, you know, the first one with Christian Bale, where he's uh, training with uh, uh, Liam Neeson's character on a frozen lake. And uh, they're doing some sword fighting and using the uh, the Batman style gauntlets. And uh, at one point, um, he tells uh, Christian Bale's Bruce Wayne, "Your parents' death was not your fault; it was your father's." And he's just mm. like taken it back all of a sudden. Like you know, my father, the guy had a gun. My father hasn't been trained. And uh, you know, Liam Neeson's character is like the the. The fact that he had a gun, the fact that he wasn't trained is nothing. He didn't have the will to take action, and that's why your parents died. Wow. And, uh, yeah, so to many men, I will say uh, your relationship with women and masculinity is not society's fault. It's your father's. Well, at some point, though, you need to take responsibility, you know, beyond beyond that, right? It might be your father to start out with, but at some point, you are your own person. And, Agree a hundred percent, and and yeah, and you need to be honest enough with yourself to say, you know, despite my father's strengths and weaknesses, there's a good chance I came out of my childhood not understanding all and and not having all the tools that I need to be the kind of man that you know I will feel satisfied with, and and women will be attracted to, and society is looking for from me and again it's not because your 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 dad was a bad guy it's not because your dad was lazy i mean in some cases it's exactly because he was lazy or because he was just absent you know um either emotionally or physically but you got to be open to say okay i i didn't learn some of the things i need to know if i if i really want to up my game as far as being a strong and confident man and you know in a in a perfect world, my dad would have taught me those things. I don't get to live in that world. So now it's up to me to teach myself. And to do that, I've got to make better friends and read better books and have deeper conversations. There's a lot of things you can do. But uh, the first step is is being able to say, you know, okay, for whatever reason, 
I don't have what I need and I need to go out there and find it. Yeah, that's well said. Okay, so part of the mistake that we make when we uh, do not receive that training or uh, get to watch that example growing up is confusion when it comes to assertiveness versus aggression, right? Um, there is uh, plenty of um, misconception going around right now where aggression, uh, rudeness, hostility, um, even cruelty – manifests itself as strength or i mean i guess another way to say it is we are we, we see a lot of cruelty and aggression and hostility being sold to us as strength and if we if we don't know any better then we're willing to buy those definitions because you know if if you can't be if you can't be strong then at least be mean is a trade-off that a lot of us who you know don't have a deep understanding of masculine strength are willing to accept, and and that's on us to to realize that you know acting aggressive and being you know stereotypically macho in whatever way we define that um, that's not good enough, and and certainly high quality women will look at that and decide that it's not good enough either. So there's there's really two kinds of ways you can be as a man that will come up lacking when confronted with attractive high value women. Mm -hmm. If you are weak and if you are overly aggressive, both of those are going to lead to women saying, eh, I'm going to pass. No, thank you. I'm not interested in what you're selling. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, I agree with that. I think, um, cause a lot of that comes down to your, uh, capacity to provide either resources or safety and right. um and and if you are overly aggressive um you are then compromising the safety of not just yourself but of that woman because now you are taking unnecessary risks right right and that's something we'll talk about later on in the book where women find risk taking attractive um but not all kinds of risks are the same, right? Yep. Uh, there's a difference between, you know, quitting your job to start a business or, um, you know, engaging in uh, rock climbing or skydiving because uh, those are calculated risks. Those are risky things to do, but you can make, you can learn enough and you can do enough to offset those risks where you still get the reward of, you know, engaging in that behavior that not a lot of people are into, but you can do it in a, as, as safe a way as possible. And that's the kind of thing that women find attractive. Um, you know, blowing all your money on scratch off lottery tickets or, uh, you know, deciding that uh, you're cool to drive after a night at the bar. Uh, those are not the kind of risks that, uh, that women will find attractive because <laughs> right. yeah. the, the consequences for versus the reward are just too high. And, and again, this, you know, women have had to evolve to recognize and, and do some calculations when it comes to those kinds of risks that uh, will give them the ability to, to look at a man's behavior and say, okay, no, this is not, this is not the kind of risk taking that is, is wise or leads to long-term, you know, safety and security. This is, this is just, this is bad behavior and mm -hmm. it's uh it's it's compromised this man's ability to measure risk and make good decisions and that is that is not something that they find attractive but you know there there are women that uh you know will be attracted to bad risk taking and there are women that will be attracted to weak men um but you know typically speaking that's because they've had trauma in their lives that have led to them making unhealthy choices and, you know, when you're a man that's working on his own mental, emotional and physical health, um, making good choices will attract good women or women, at least that are good for you and making bad choices will attract women that are bad for you. And so that's uh, that's something that should be in the front of your mind when it comes to making yourself a better man who is found more attractive. Um, you want to attract healthier, better women. Um, because that leads to a happy life. I mean, even if you're looking for very short term romances, um, you, you never know exactly how things are going to go. And so if you are 
engaging in behavior that will attract women that are not at their most healthy, that the consequences for that can last a lifetime. For sure. All right. So um, that kind of addresses, you know, the assertiveness versus uh, aggressiveness. And hopefully you're convinced that uh, uh, assertiveness is the way to go, because, I mean, women want a man who has a who has that has a lot of tools in his toolbox for solving problems. OK, right. um, not just one tool. You know, when when you're a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. So yep. if if you're only a, you're, the only way you solve problems is by hitting them, then you know, you're going to see every problem is as something that needs to be solved by being hit and your ability to solve a wide ranging variety of problems is, is not going to be there. So, um, but that said, uh, when it comes down to it, if, if a problem does need to be approached with physical strength, as sometimes they do, um, you need to have that physical strength in your toolbox or you're not going to be able to solve that problem. Correct. All right, so let's talk about that. Um, a man who has a strong body is going to look like he's strong. Um, you know, I one one of the uh, strength training podcasts I listened to uh, once had the question: you know, how can I have a big chest that these guys who are able to you know put up three plates, uh, which is three hundred and fifteen pounds on the bench? You know, how can I get a strong chest that looks like the chest of these guys that can lift 315 pounds? The answer to how you get that chest is be able to lift 315 pounds. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's, there's no way to trick your body into looking like you're very, you have a very strong chest other than having a strong chest. Yes and no, right? I mean, because it depends on the, the training that you do. So a lot of, you know, so for example, a lot of uh, a lot of bodybuilders, yeah, you know, they they are they focus more on the hypertrophy, the growth of the muscle, not necessarily the strength. So there is a little bit of a difference there. Um, but a little bit of line, a difference. A, there. a little bit, right? A little right. bit of a difference. So yeah, if we're if we're gonna we're gonna split hairs here, absolutely. So um, so some, for example, some power lifters are definitely stronger than bodybuilders for sure, right? Um, you know, but but. Regardless, um, yeah, both of them have have you know sizable chests for sure. Right, but there's no there's no bodybuilder that's winning any competitions that uh, is failing to get 135 pounds up off of his chest and needs right. a, needs a yeah. spotter to come rescue him. All right, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so let's talk about uh, and and I, I think this it's valuable that this uh, book starts out at the beginning of how to become attractive with building a strong body because um, the great thing about being strong is that the stuff that it takes to have a strong body also results in you having a strong mind and and some would say that the I mean w one of the messages of uh, David Goggins book you know the reason that he started running 100 mile ultra marathons was because he felt his mind was too weak and he needed to make it strong. And then he just used um, running long distances as a tool to make his mind strong. And as a result, he got a strong body in the, in the bargain. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. And, That's crazy. Talk to me a hundred, a hundred miles. Wow. But yeah. I, you know, I, I appreciate that. That's for sure. When you're pushing your body, you need to, you know, if you want to continue to make progress um, yeah, it takes some mental fortitude to, to push through those uncomfortable feelings for sure. Yeah. And you, when, when you have a strong body, people will look at you differently because they know that to get that strong body, you did things that a lot of people are, a lot of men are not willing to do. Right. I mean, if, uh, if you look at somebody and, and you can tell from their physique that they can probably lift some very heavy weight, then you make assumptions about them that they are, um, you know, hardworking, that they're focused, that they're persistent. And, you know, whether those things are actually true or not, um, well, I mean, it's well, hard to they, think of a scenario well, where they're not true, right? Well, well so they, they are absolutely in that discipline in terms of, right. you know, the, 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 the weightlifting and, you know, potentially, you know, the, their eating and their, 
you know, their, their schedule. They, they do have the capacity to do that. It doesn't, you're right though. It doesn't mean that it necessarily applies to other aspects of your life. It may not, you know, it may not apply to, you know, some, some work ethic, you know, it may, it may not apply to the job that they're doing. And, but it does show that they do have the capacity to do that. And if you, right. if you remember a lot of, uh, a lot, I think in this book and I've heard other where, other places, it's women aren't necessarily looking for a guy who's making a ton of money, but basically somebody who, uh, is ambitious and is maybe working on a business or on a plan and, and, and looking to, to become successful. Right. And I feel, feel like he's showing potential there. Right. So the takeaway I got from, from some of that information was that it's, you don't necessarily have to be this, you know, this perfect, this perfect individual, but you have to show some sort of potential to become better than where you are. Right. And, and that's a, a thing, a, a big part of, uh, of attraction that we will keep coming back to is the fact that, uh, women are able to, um, view potential in men in a way that, uh, men may not be able to conversely view potential in women. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we were just talking about it in the last one about, um, you know, when it comes to facial hair, um, a woman does not need to see that you've got a giant, bushy, long beard to think that you have, you know, a a significant amount of testosterone that it takes to grow facial hair, right? Yep. If you even just have stubble, which is what is stubble except the potential to grow a beard, right? Yeah. That stubble is able to be as attractive or in many cases more attractive than that big unruly beard because <laughs> you're you're able to to display, hey, I could do this if I wanted to, but I'm also able to keep, you know, a a fairly clean cut look by yeah. just having, you know, a couple of days of stubble on my face. Good point. Yeah. And so um, the same thing is true when it comes to um, your body. And there are things you can do, uh, such as managing your body fat, as well as, um, you know, having some sort of an underlying muscular nature to your physique that can communicate that, okay, even though I don't look like a bodybuilder and I don't look like a power lifter, you know, women can see even the way you wear your clothes, like, okay, this, this is a guy, there's, there's something going on there that says he doesn't just uh, indulge in every whim when it comes to, uh, eating whatever food passes across his, uh, his mindset or, uh, you know, when it, Every, every time he has the idea of, boy, it'd be nice to just take a lazy day and lay in my bed and watch Netflix all day. Uh, he doesn't say yes to that every time it crosses his mind. He's clearly out there doing something that's making his body look like he's prepared to deal with something uh, unexpected when it comes up. Yeah. It, in, it, to me, it shows that you care about something, right? And it also right. shows you care about yourself. And I feel like, you know, that there's a number of different benefits with that. So, I mean, for me, you know, the people in my life, uh, you know, my friends and family, anybody that I'm close to um, uh, that I care about, they're people who, who care about something or passionate about something. It doesn't even have to be passionate, but you have to care. And if you, you know, and if you're in, in, in decent shape, it means you do care enough about, about something. And, and the best part is you care about yourself. And to me, that also translates into you're, you're kind of selling yourself, right? Because you're showing that you care about yourself. That helps other people care about you because you are your best advocate. Right. And so yeah. basically if you don't care about yourself, if you don't love yourself, why would anybody else? Honestly, it's, it's, you are, you are ask. I mean, they do. I mean, that does happen. Absolutely. You know, you know, when, when people are, you know, down in the dumps and things like that, but, but basically, uh, you know, the, the, the thing is you, you really are, your own best salesman uh, when it comes to yourself. It also helps build confidence uh, in yourself, and you're going to carry that with you because you're going to feel be feeling good that you're you're doing something for yourself. It's going to make you feel confident, but it's also going to make you feel physically better. And when you're you're feeling physically better, you walk a little bit better. You you know you carry yourself with a little bit more uh, energy, and um, you become a little bit more aware. And all of those things uh, add to your overall attraction. I feel. Yeah, I, I feel like um, this this part of the book, he's a little bit um, a little bit negative on, you know, the uh, the guys that are overweight, carrying some extra pounds and don't don't spend the time working out that maybe they should for their own attractiveness as well as their own physical health. Um, 
you know, because again, just coming off of tiny habits, you know, what did we learn? We learned that people change when they feel good, not when they feel bad. You can't, yeah. you can't shame somebody into, you know, deciding that they need to lose some weight or hit the gym. Um, if it were that easy, then we would all be spending a lot more time in the gym because, you know, society and culture does a, a pretty good job of, of shaming us for not matching up to whatever the current, uh, decision is as far as you know what what a man or a woman needs to look like i mean I, I was just uh listening to the um the episode of uh two bears one cave where tom sakura and andrew huberman hosted together and uh yeah the the damage that is being done to young men right now from hollywood where you know you've got these guys in their 40s and 50s and 60s that are just huge and jacked and, you know, 8% body fat, some, sometimes less. And not a single one of them talks about the, uh, steroids that they're taking to get their bodies to that point or the, the way they're dehydrating themselves on the, on the one day out of the shoot where they have to be seen without a shirt on. And, you know, it's just, it's ridiculous. It's just they're they're out there telling people that they you know they're eating their chicken and their broccoli and they're you know going to the gym two hours a day every day and that's it. That's all that they're saying. And then that leaves you know so many young men in particular thinking, okay, well I'll just eat chicken and broccoli and I'll go to the gym two hours a day. And they're doing that, but they're still not looking like a you know fifty five year old Hugh Jackman or whatever he is. Mm-hmm. And you know it's and, and their message was you know. Um, by all means, if, if you want to sell tickets and you need to get in that kind of shape, then do that. But, you know, every time you're asked about what you're doing to get in that kind of shape, don't just openly lie to the world about what it is that you're doing. Just be honest and say, hey, I'm, I'm doing this, that and the other. And that's what's you know helping me. Even I mean, even guys like, you know, The Rock and and, uh, you know, fill in the, the Marvel superhero of your choice. Any professional they're, they're, wrestler. They're not even. Any prof- they're not even admitting to TRT. They're not even willing yeah. to say, you know, yeah. yeah, I'm doing 250 a week of TRT to, uh, you know, supplement my my body's hormones. They're, it's just, you know, I'm eating right and I'm going to the gym and I'm cutting back on the alcohol. That's about as much as they're willing to admit to. And it seems to be, you know, again, watching these guys get older and older and getting bigger and more cut every single time they put out a new movie feels yeah. ridiculous and disingenuous. But anyway, eno- enough about that. Um, you, you don't have to look like that to be in the top 10 percent of men with attractive bodies by any means. You know, and the other thing to think about here is that, right, um, you remember that um for for men, right? Where I mean, it's a, l- a perfect example. You know, we're programmed to always be focused on a lot of the physical stuff, right? But you remember that that's right. a small component of uh, so it's, it's, it's you know it's one of you know many components that you know f- women find attractive, and so you don't need to be looking like Hugh Jackman to you know to be attractive to women. Yes, how you yes how you act is the single most important thing that you need to worry about when it comes to being attractive to women. Um, and then how you look communicates to them certain things about the way that you think and the way that you act. Right. Correct. Um, yeah. So, so you definitely yeah. have an advantage if you are in really good shape for sure, because then it's a lot less verbal communication. You're basically show you're communicating a lot of these things that, you know, that you're, you're confident that you're, you're disciplined, you know, you, you, you care about something, you've got potential to care about other things. A lot of that is communicated in, if you are in, in, in good shape. And so it's definitely beneficial to you. Um, but it's, you know, it, it, it's not necessarily a requirement. And if anything, it, it will, you know, it will help you and, and you should be doing, you should be exercising for yourself more than, than other people here. I feel like we're, we're kind of, kind of going down the road. Well, you should be doing it for, for, for the ladies, whatever, but it's not, it's, it. I think it's really for you, but you don't have to be crazy about it either. Right. Yeah. And that's, you know, an, another thing to remember is, you know, there, there is, pr- we, we talked about this, I think in the first episode about how, you know, there are some guys that are just naturally good looking enough where they don't have to really think about any of the stuff we're talking about. It's a very, very small, like sub 10% or, or even maybe very, very much less. Um, I mean, think, think of our case study from the last episode, you know, with Peter, this guy who decides that he sees his pretty girl and he, um, 
you know, is going to change his daily behavior so that he can see her at the coffee shop whenever he can, you know, take a really, really good looking guy and put him in that cheap suit and, you know, have, have his methodology of meeting this girl be, I'm just going to stare at her for a couple of weeks before I walk up to her. I mean, can you imagine how good looking a guy would have to be to be in a cheap suit and to, to communicate that behavior of, you know, I, I stood on the other side of the, of the coffee shop and stared at you for a couple of weeks before I walked up and said, hi, I mean, maybe there is a guy that's so good looking that that combination of behavior would still get him a phone number. But yeah, I mean, it's hard to think know. about how, I mean, yeah, displaying that sheepish kind of timid behavior and, and wearing that crappy suit. I, I feel like two weeks of seeing that guy act that way, it, it almost wouldn't matter what he looked like if he if he behaved that way for a couple of weeks straight. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I mean, again, I go back to putting myself in her shoes. And if it was even a beautiful supermodel who was doing that to me, I'd be like, she seems mentally unstable. Right. Like there's, there's something going on. Like why, you know, it, it's just a little bit odd. It's like off putting. So, you know, regardless of, you know, uh, right. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, it really kind of comes down to behavior and it just, I keep doing that because it really, that's what makes it clear to me about how obvious it is. And, and, and the reason why I say this is because it wasn't so obvious to me when I was younger, when I was right. doing things like that. And exactly. Just, Holy cow. You know, you're standing out like a sore thumb now. Right. Although, um, you know, I will I will disagree with you where, you know, if I was single and someone with supermodel looks stared at me yeah. for a couple of weeks and then walked up and said hi, I would probably still be ready to uh, give her a shot. <laughs> no matter how awkward she was for the two weeks beforehand. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I, I would be I would be caught and I, I'll, I'll backpedal on that. I'll say I'll see. I'd be cautiously optimistic. I'd probably give her a shot, too. But I would never forget. I'm like, wow, why? You know that's a little bit of odd behavior, you know, to, to kind of, you know, is it odd behavior for women though? I mean, when, when, when society says it's guy's job to, you know, approach and be the one to start things, um, you know, I, I don't uh, yeah, know. Because I, I, women are so I, much more subtle and I feel like, you know, like they're, they're so much better at, at, you know, you know, creating opportunities for us to meet them than, than we realize, right. He even talks about right. this in the book, yeah, yeah, right. For sure. Um, so, so yeah, I, I but I, I'm, I guess I'm, what I'm doing is I'm over exaggerating, you know, the, the scene in my head right now where it's, you know, she's, she's literally standing and staring kind of thing, which we don't even know, right. This is, this is just, this is, this is just the story that he told in the book. So who knows what this guy was doing? Maybe he true, was subtle true. too. Maybe, maybe yeah, he was it, subtle too, you know? Yeah. Or I mean, you know, maybe, yeah. And, and what's subtle for a man versus what's subtle for a woman, right. You know, for a woman right. where women have this, you know, threat detection, um, six sense, if you will. Yeah, yeah. That, that men don't have to have, you know, it's, it's yeah. possible like, Oh yeah. I, uh, I noticed her and I, I figured she was just shy. I'm so glad she came to say hi. You know, you can, you can, you can overlook some pretty crazy behavior from a woman if she's physically attractive enough when you're a man, because again, I think it does speak to just how differently wired we are than they are. Yeah. All right. So let's see. Um, let's go into a little bit more detail than the book does. I mean, he, he mentioned some of the benefits of working out, you know, better immune system, mental strength, higher testosterone levels, um, more respect, bone density, um, greater masculinity projection. But let's, let's talk about, uh, where where to start here? Um, I'm a big fan of the uh, starting strength protocol for getting into uh, lifting weights. Um, I, I benefited from it quite a bit, and you know it's to the point where between you know being on testosterone replacement therapy and the uh, foundation that I laid with starting strength, uh, even when I'm not in the gym lifting all the time, my body still looks like a guy who lifts weights. And uh, I can get back to some pretty uh, heavy weight loads pretty quickly as a result of learning the program, learning the lifts and, and doing the linear progression uh, with starting strength. I know strong lifts is another popular one that a lot of people have had success with. Um, the, the big thing that I recommend is using uh, large compound lifts uh, such as the squat, the deadlift, the overhead press and the bench press. Uh, for guys that are younger than you and I are, Dan, he usually recommends uh, power cleans as well. But he also says, you know, once you hit about 40, the uh, 
the value of power cleans can kind of get uh, diminished based on the potential risk to your your joints and stuff. So I don't do power cleans at all anymore. I, I focus on uh, four uh, weight lifts, which are bench press, overhead press, deadlift, and squat. And then I supplement that with some things like uh, chin-ups, pull-ups, and dips, and push-ups. Um, so that's that's where I'm at. You can You can literally transform the way your body looks by just doing four things when you go to the gym um squats bench overhead press and deadlifts yeah and and for the only downside to that is for people who are starting out those are those could be um difficult movements to get right with just watching videos so i would suggest getting a personal trainer um, and, yes. and, and getting that form down before you really get into, you know, starting some of these compound movements. Um, you know, the, 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 what might be helpful is just doing some of the body weight stuff. Like you were talking about, maybe some like push ups and pull ups and, um, and, and maybe some dips and things like that to, to start out with before, you know, if you're not ready for the big compound movements, because they can be intimidating for sure. Before I started squatting, um, I, I, I was, I had been working on the gym for years before I actually, you know, did back, you know, back squats and, um, you know, and it just looked intimidating to me because it was just kind of like, Oh, you know, and you hear these stories about people blowing their knees out and not having proper form and people dropping the weights on themselves and things. And so it could be very intimidating. And if you get in your head enough, that's going to affect how you're sure. performing the, the movement. So, you know, I would suggest that we, those are absolutely right. Those, I, I agree with you. Those are, those are some fantastic movements and you can kind of keep life simple by just focusing on those, but make sure you get your form down right before you, you, you dip in there. Yeah. yeah, I, I agree with that. I would say, and uh, I mean, the, the biggest thing from a safety standpoint is don't bench press alone with collars on your barbell uh, because that is pretty much the only one of those weights that actually kills people. Yep. Um, when you, uh, when you can't get the weight up on a bench press and you don't have a spotter and you've put the things on the end of the bar that hold the weight in place, then yeah, that's, that's how you could die because if it ends up on your chest or on your neck, then it can be, you know, curtains for you. Right. The, um, the, the so plates it, can't slide off. Right? Exactly. So if you, yep. if you do bench press alone, do it without putting the, uh, the collars on the end so that if you get in trouble, you can just put all your energy into lifting one part of the bar heavy or high enough so that they slide off the one end and then they will very quickly and dramatically slide off the other end very, very fast. <laughs> and a 45 pound bar on your chest is not a problem, but a, right, you know, right. uh, even a, a bar with a little bit of weight on it, if you can't get it up, you know, having it on your chest or your neck too long, that's, that's yeah. bad news. So, yep, um, sure. Yeah, I'll uh, put a link in the show notes for this episode. Uh, there are some really, really good videos out there that will teach you some of the form. But in addition to that, especially and, you know, when you're talking about just the empty bar, I think you can you can get started with uh, just watching some videos. But then once you start noticing the speed at which you're able to lift getting really slow, uh, then then, yeah, I would say, you know, invest the money in uh, there's plenty of starting strength coaches around the country. If, if that's the program that you like that will, you know, spend an hour with you and take you through, um, you show them how you're currently squatting, how you're currently benching, how you're overhead pressing and how you're deadlifting. And within one session, they'll be able to, to, to clean up your form enough to keep you safe until, you know, the weight gets really crazy. I mean, I, I've only had, uh, I think I've had two sessions with a starting strength coach and I still on the deadlift, I still get a little sloppy and can, uh, tweak my back a little bit, but, uh, I, I at least have you know watched enough video and and had a a coach train me so that I know uh, as soon as I, something doesn't feel right, it's like yeah, I messed up on my form. I need to I need to take the weight back down and and you know work on my form a little bit more because you know it's it's tempting to try to get your your number your numbers up and hit those new personal bests at the expense of good form, which is how you end up hurting yourself, especially when you're you know mid forties like I am. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's see. We are at uh, 44 minutes right now, Dan. I think uh, if you've got anything else to say about getting strong, now's a good time. And then let's talk a little bit about some uh, some tips or some, some ways that we've had value added to our life uh, the last week. And uh, we'll, we'll cut it short there. And then next week we'll start about uh, – we'll talk about choosing the right hairstyle. 
Yeah, no, I think um, I think we've kind of summed it up, you know, and, and the biggest thing that – the biggest takeaway that I've learned from going to the gym really is feeling uh, physically uncomfortable as you kind of push your limits a little bit. It's very mm, easy to do yeah. that when you're when you're lifting weights or, you know, even running a little bit. It's, you know, or, or doing some sort of cardiovascular stuff. You can feel when you're, you're breathing a little bit heavier and you can – you have, you know, objective measurements in terms of, you know, speed or how long you've gone or incline, things like that, as well as, you know, weights or volume and things like that. And so um, a lot of that is um, is really valuable. And don't forget to kind of pat yourself on the back. Again, going back to tiny habits, celebrate yeah. when you actually have pushed yourself a little bit where you get physically uncomfortable because it does a couple of things. It encourages you to, to, to do it again, but also makes you feel uh makes it makes you feel good. And that, and that allows you then to say, Hey, uh, I'm more willing to do this again, rather than going, Oh my God, this was miserable. I'm miserable right. because I'm in so much pain. I'm never going to do this again. Exactly. And, and that's not, and that's, and that's not what, what you want. If in fact, BJ talks about, you know, doubling down on the celebration when you've really pushed yourself, when you're feeling that physical pain, right. And, you know, that, that is really great practice for getting out of your comfort zone. And it's something you can easily translate into, other things you're doing, men, you know, in your life on a mental level at that point, it's just like, well, you know what? I, I regularly get out of my comfort zone. I'm regularly pushing myself in the gym. Why can't I just push myself a little bit longer to, you know, to figure out this issue that I'm, I'm, right. I'm having here, whatever that might be. Right. And that, that's where, yeah, it's, it or not. mindset and context is just, it's so important when you consider what we can do as humans. This is one of the takeaways I got from um, the Sam Harris uh, episode of Huberman. Um, cause they talked about a lot of things over the four and a half hours. But one of the things that Sam Harris said was, it's amazing what your mind and body can tolerate and even look forward to when the context and the mindset is right. So he said, yeah. think about how it feels to deadlift 350, 400 pounds, right? If you woke up in the middle of the night and your body felt the same way, just in your laid in your bed that you feel when you're trying to get 400 pounds off the ground at the gym, you would immediately you would think, oh, my God, I'm dying. <laughs> this, is, this is it. It's all yeah. over. Right. But yeah. when you're when you're in the gym, when you're wearing the clothes, you're wearing the shoes, you're listening to the music and you're about to you know get that PR on, on your deadlift. When you're done with that, you feel ecstatic. Where if that same those same bodily sensations in another scenario, <laughs> you would have no doubt you were about to die. <laughs> I love the analogy. That's great. Yeah, and uh, it's it's really yeah what you're capable of. And you, you ever have that experience, Dan, where you're watching a movie that you absolutely love with someone for the first time, like a friend or a, a partner. And you feel jealous, like, oh, my God, I wish I got to watch this for the first time like you're getting to do right now, because it's just so amazing to experience that. That's the way I feel about people doing the uh, novice linear progression on starting strength for the first time. You know, when uh, they yeah, when they go in the gym and just for, you know, literally two or three months, they're able to put five or ten pounds on the bar every Ooh. time they go to the gym. And it's fairly easy for them to take those leaps up on some of those on some of those lifts where it's like god i i have to i have to crash, uh, scratch and claw to get, put two and a half pounds on the bar on my overhead press at this point. You know, when I go back in the gym and I try to get that overhead press up just by two and a half pounds, it will take me weeks to be able to do that where you know, yeah. somebody's just starting out. So guys, if if you're starting out and, and you want to get on board with the starting strength program. And, and again, I'll put some links to some great videos that uh, help you, you know, learn how to do those lifts. Uh, you're able to go in the gym and, you know, literally three times a week, you can add five or 10 pounds to the bar every time you go to the gym. Um, what I wouldn't give to have that kind of progress again. So, so, I mean, you're not going to have that exact same feeling again, but you know, this is a good reason to then when you get back into the gym, finally to not start very aggressively, like at your, your, you know, at your capacity start right. where it's so easy that you can get that experience where you're, you're putting on five pounds, 10 pounds, you know, and, and, you know, build up. Now you're not setting a PR every time. Right. right? Exactly. But, yeah. That's, but yeah. it's still mentally, you're still going to be, you know, still feeling good. Okay. Look, I'm, I'm doing well. And also you're not going to be 
destroying your body because you haven't lifted <laughs> right. in, in three months. Yes, and, exactly. and right. So yeah, I think, I think it's really, uh, you're just basically making a great point of why we should, you know, start out slowly when we're, we're getting back into the gym. Yeah. And whether you're starting out from scratch or you're getting back to it, you know, because a lot of us, you know, might have lifted in high school or college or the military or whatever. Um, yeah, starting slow is the way to go, but there, there is that still, I do feel that a little bit of jealousy for the guys that, uh, are, yeah. are, I mean, when I, I started when I was what, 30, 36 or 37, that was the first time I ever started starting strength. And, uh, yeah, it feels good, especially when your, your bench or your squat or your deadlift, like when you start surpassing your own body weight for the first time, um, that, that feels, that feels pretty good. That's great, man. So, all right, cool. Um, real quick, uh, wanted to actually, you know what, let's, let's stop there. I think, I think that's okay. good for now. And then, uh, uh, a little preview of the next, uh, the next time we talk about a uh, little life hacks or, or purchases that we found value. I'm going to talk about the app that I use to find dirt cheap airline tickets that I use to fly to cities where I like to go on tours and walk around and work remotely and stuff like that. There's one app that I have found to be better than any of the rest. And I'm going to talk about it at the next, uh, next episode. Great. I'm curious to hear that. All right, cool. All right, Dan, thanks a lot. I will uh, talk to you soon. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye.